Hey everybody, welcome to our weekly data talk, a show where we talk with data science leaders from around the world. This is our brand new season. It's the new year. We took December off and uh, excited to be back. And we actually had our guest, Fabio Vasquez, um, as our guest back in season one and super excited to have Fabio back with us today. Fabio, how's it going, man? Hello, uh, it's, it's awesome to be here again. Thank you, Mike, for, for having me. And a, a lot has changed in the last uh, uh, podcast. So I think it's, it's gonna be an interesting follow-up to what's going on. So cool. And, and I gotta say, you are like so active right now on social media. I see your posts on LinkedIn all the time. You're writing articles. You have your own show, which I want you to talk about today. Um, and aside from all that, you also have your day job. You're working, uh, you know, you're a physicist, you're a computer engineer, you're working in data science and computational cosmology. Uh, and then you also launched, and can you talk a little bit about your, you're the founder of Ciencia y Datos. Can you talk a little bit about that initiative? Yeah, of course. So uh, the the goal of Ciencia y Datos, it's, uh, I mean, it started out as a project for, uh, for expanding the knowledge of, data science in Spanish. And right now it's only a blog. It's, it's like a medium blog where people can add their articles, uh, their ideas, whatever they want. And we have a lot of followers and people writing articles now for Sensei Datos. Uh, but in the near future, what I'm planning to do is transforming that into a bigger platform uh, for sharing and for uh, courses in Spanish, data science, and, 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 not, and not, not only data science. Uh, I mean, uh, culture, engineering, philosophy, whatever you want, because the name of the of the uh, company is uh, data and science, or science and data. So it's not only restricted to to, to data science; mm -hmm. it's, it's more like a, like a global thing. I think that's so cool. What have you found? Um, like, is there? I, I love the fact that you're actually breaking into uh, the Spanish market to get a lot more content in Spanish. When you kind of looked around, are, is there is there like a lot of data science stuff written in Spanish right now? So um, I think a lot of people doing data science in, in, in the Spanish world. We have a lot of people doing data science in, in Spain, in Latin America, in the United States that are Spanish speakers. Uh, but the thing is we have not that many resources for learning or sharing. Um, I mean, right now Coursera has some Spanish courses and EDX too, stuff like that. But the the gap between Spanish and English is, is huge. And and when when you go to books uh, like written papers or articles, I mean, there's, there's no comparison at all. So uh, what what the idea for for this project was to uh, to enable people that are not English speakers or they don't know how to speak English to be able to access the information we all get from the English world. Mm. And and one of the other things I'm doing is I'm contacting people and I'm translating their articles and they're gonna put them in their name because they have a medium account. I just uh, give them uh, the, the Spanish transla translation to their article and they'll put it there. So uh, it, people can, can, can read that too. I think that's wonderful. And also, aside from that, you're also teaching, right? I, I saw you're now an instructor, a data science instructor for Business Science University. Yeah, so that's one of the other biggest, uh, bigger projects we have for, for this year. Um, I'm working with Matt Dancho. He's a rock star data scientist. He works in business science. He founded that company. And I joined him last year to create uh, the Python version of his courses, something like that. He has mm -hmm. uh, R courses, uh, and they're all related to data science uh, for business. That's the main goal of the of the university. Um, uh, and I'm building right now one course that will be uh, launched very that will be uh, live very soon. It is business analysis with with Python, where I'm gonna teach people how to write Python code but with a business idea in mind, like how to solve business problems, how to use the libraries, how to do all those different things. And we're also working on methodologies for data science, like workflows, cheat sheets, where we're, we're trying to help the community uh, and, and give them the power to, to really use data science with a business perspective. 
That is so cool. Uh, for those that are interested in um, taking one of your classes, what, what's the best way for them to learn about that? So right now you can go to university.business-science.io and you will see math courses. They're live right now. My, my courses are still in progress. Uh, I think for, for next month, uh, I'm going to be launching my first course there. So right now there's no course for, for me to teach you. But just um, make sure you read the articles. We're, we're going to be preparing for that for, uh, so you can see what you, what, what you can expect from, from the courses we're creating for you. I think that's wonderful. Fabio, what I love about you is that you just have a passion for helping others uh, learn about data science. Um, and also what I appreciate too is the way that you write, the way that you teach, um, you make it easier to understand, especially for those of us like myself out of the data science world, you're able to explain concepts and things um, at my level, which is a lot, which is a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I think writing is an art in itself and you keep getting better and better when you start writing. I mean, I, I never thought I would be writing articles in, in, in any field. Uh, I was just a consumer of all these different things. Uh, but then I realized there are some benefits on writing. And, and one of the first ones is you really uh, can uh, concentrate all your knowledge and all the things you've been learning into one piece you have forever. Because you're going to read that uh, today or in one year or in 10 years and it's still be, it's still, it's, it's still going to be there. And one of the other things is that it will help you, it will also help you uh, to really uh, understand the topic you're trying to talk about. Because it's not the same. When you, want to, when you talk to, to, to a colleague or a friend about a topic, it's easy because it's, it's like informal talking. But when you're writing for, for an audience, you need to be uh, like, you need to understand what you're saying, read and read again your, what you're saying, and research, uh, read more articles and books, and watch some webinars or whatever. So you learn even more. And for me, this is a, a way of, of giving back all of the things I've learned. And, and I think in data science, uh, we are very, uh, I mean, I am very grateful that in the last years, a lot of the great minds in the field uh, came together and created courses and articles and blogs that really uh, changed the way we saw the topics. Because when you are starting and you have an article and a book, like a paper, you are very lost. It's, 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 it's hard to understand what you're reading. And then when you have these distilled blocks with a very simple explanation, then you see, oh, this is it. And then you can go back to the book or go back to the paper and really understand what they're saying. Fabio, what also I love about you is that you're constantly learning. You're constantly challenging yourself into these physics, data science, and then you are just actively, continually learning and growing. How is it important is it for those who are you know, just graduating school to have that kind of growth mindset? So I think uh, every career needs this, and, and not only data science or programming or whatever. I think whenever, if, you, if you're studying, I don't know, law or, or, or uh, engineering, you need to keep studying forever because things are changing and they're changing very, very fast. And you need to be aware that when you're in the day-to-day -day job, you, you're stuck in one theory of working. It's like when you're working in a company, you don't have that many, I mean, you have the freedom to do whatever you want. You do what they tell you to do and that's fine because it works. You can experience stuff like that. But outside of that company, of uh, there's a whole world of knowledge that you you should be aware of, and one of the easiest way to do that is to be curious and try to read articles, uh, watch some videos, uh, and if you can go to conferences, I think that's one of the easiest way to get uh, to, to to get knowledge in a very 
fast way because if when you go to a conference if you see like 10 different talks of people active in the research field and then you see okay so now i mean i know the state of art of x and that was only in one day you don't need you, you didn't need to read like a thousand, a thousand articles for that and 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 I, I think one of the other important things for this is that when you're learning all of these things that are in the outside world, you can bring that into your daily job. And that's when you're adding value, a lot of value to your company because when, if, if you're aware of what's going on in the research field or in other industries and you can have that and grab that and, and, and apply it to your day-to-day -day job, then you can really change the way uh, things are be, uh, being done in that company. Well, you know, you're definitely proof of this. Um, I love just your how much you are uh, invested in learning about data science, continuing to grow in that field, and then also just being a thought leader and helping other people um, become competent and becoming a great data scientist. And, and definitely one of those things I want to talk to you about is how you're doing that through your blog writing, through the articles that you're producing. And I love how you are taking your different interests in cosmology, physics, even philosophy, and bringing them into these articles about data science. How did you start to kind of merge all those different fields? So um, if you've seen my latest articles, I, I think I've written three of those. Um, this has been a change in, in the way I perceive data science. It, it's, it's the same uh, definition I gave last year or even the, two years ago. But now um, I'm trying to give a more uh, general uh, to give a more general way to see data science and machine learning. Um, in my latest article call, uh, called the, "The Data Fabric for for, for Machine Learning," I t I gave a comparison between the Einstein general theory of relativity and machine learning or, and data science and. That was something that came to my, my, my to my mind, and I, I I said, okay, I'm gonna write it, and let's see what people think about this. But <laughs> uh, the 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 main concept in those articles I'm I'm writing are that we may need to change the way we do data science right now because, I mean, I'm writing an article right now that it's gonna be posted very soon that says that I'm really exhausted on having a thousand tables and writing a million lines of code of SQL joins to get the uh, number of customers that bought the X product between X uh, and Y in this state. I mean, this, this shouldn't be this hard. And I mean, I, I know it's not that hard, but we take so much time mm -hmm. to to try to understand these relational databases. And relational databases uh, were good. I think they were a very important uh, uh, advance in the computer science. But right now, uh, I'm taking a shift into graph databases. I think uh, they can add something very different to what we're seeing in the world and relationships in graph databases are first class citizens. And that's important because one of the things we don't have in relational databases, and that's kind of ironic, that relations in relational databases are not first class citizens. Mm -hmm. Because if we want to understand uh, what's, uh, what's in common between two tables or to get a, an average or, or, or two, three different tables, we need to add a lot of code to be able to join those tables. Mm -hmm. So this, those were one of the, the first parts. And, and the other part is the concept of, of ontology. And ontology in the way of, of computer science means relationship too, like the way two entities are related to each other. And when we are doing all of these different things, we can think of something called the knowledge graph. And this is what Google is doing right now. You know, there's a great video on YouTube right now. You can search is knowledge graph Google. Uh, there's an explanation or on, on how Google changed in in the way that before the, they understood this, this theory of graph, they were searching by like 
um, like keywords, like keywords and images and stuff like that to have an idea of what you meant with, with the words you were searching. But right now, they really understand the words you're searching, like because they understand the meaningful relationship between the words you're, you're building. And, and not only Google, it's like, I think a lot of like, like Facebook is doing that too. Amazon is doing that too. So we're seeing a shift in the way we do data towards knowledge graph and semantics and ontology. And I, I think people is, I mean, we're not aware of that. I mean, I was not aware of that until I started doing my research. So what I'm trying to do with these articles is trying to uh, to say to people, hey, something's changing. Um, is is I, I'm not meaning that what you know right now is, is worthless. It's like you should take a look on what's happening in the research field because in my interest, you too. No doubt. I, I like how you brought in the example of the Google Knowledge Graph. I don't know too much about that, but I, I think what's interesting is the um, – as you talk about in search or even voice assistants, how they're getting smarter as you're beginning to look for things. For example, I might be looking for something yesterday and I might add in a variation today and Google will remember, right? That search that I did yesterday and will either pull up things that I already looked at or bring in some other things that it thinks I might be looking yeah. for. And, 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 and there's a very important piece. I mean, there's a three lines in my article that are the most important lines in the articles and and they say that when you're doing a query on a graph database the query becomes part of the knowledge of the mm -hmm. graph that's it that's the difference between that's one of the biggest differences when you're doing a sql query on a on a table or three tables you have the query and that's it i mean this Nothing will change with the database, but when you're building graph databases and you have uh, and and you've built ontologies on top of the data you have, when you're doing a new query, that query will also add information to um, to to that knowledge graph to that graph. So you're getting data when you're searching for data, and one of the 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 cool things I like about graph databases is that you're when you're trying to explain something to uh, to someone normally you'll just you'll just you'll use a graph uh, form to explain like this is here and the, this is here and here i mean it's it will be very weird for someone to explain like imagine your teacher trying trying to explain you um a concept using tables and joints i mean that's that's not happening i mean the way we do databases right now it's not uh the way we think mm. and and that's one of the things that i like because it's closer to the way we develop our our thinking and thoughts and the way we we see the world is this uh changing um even the process of how you're how you're visualizing the data afterward so right now i'm i'm building uh two things one is i'm while writing this i'm building my picture of the future of data science i mean i i don't have the full picture right now i have i have an idea of what it could be um i mean so I, i'm not exactly sure to i mean what will be the end of this research i'm doing I mean, last year, if, if, if you followed me, my research was on deep learning, and I wrote a lot of articles on deep learning. This year, I'll be focusing on, on this new topic. Uh, the next year, I, I don't know. So um, right now, the way we see data is, is just uh, rows and columns in the table. Like, that's, that's a lot of what we're seeing right now when we talk to someone. But... When you go to companies and when you, I mean, I'm doing consultants for a lot of different companies. And when, when you go there, you see that the main problem they have is not doing machine learning or deep learning or, 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 or how to build X algorithm is what data do I have mm. and how can I understand my data? And, and when do I know I can uh, trust my data? So I think uh, right now we're on a path 
on changing the way we see data because now data is not only, I mean, right now people are collecting data just for having data. And, and that didn't happen before. Before we collect data for doing something like, okay, I want to improve uh, this process. So I'm collecting the data to do that. Now it's backwards. People are getting data just to have it. And then they'll think, what should I do with this data? It's, it's, and, 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 and it's happening to a lot of companies. I mean, I come to companies that said to me, so I have these databases and they're huge and I have no yeah. idea what to do with them. So um, data now is like a, um, uh, the most important things we have in, in, in companies. And I, I think the way we see it and understand it will be changing in, in, in the near future. Do you think that, um, I mean, I think it's wonderful that we're collecting more and more data, to try to find out what's useful. But then, Fabio, what you're saying is there's a huge challenge now about the amount of data being collected because now there's just so much. But now they need someone like you, a consultant, to come in to help advise them on, okay, what do we do with this data to make it useful? Yeah, so I... I I really think that it's now more common that companies have their own like center of excellence. This is something very uh, common I'm seeing right now that they have people that know their data, they know their databases, um, but what they're missing is trying to connect the business to the data. It's like, okay, so I have all this business idea that I know or I believe that will change the way we do things and I have all this data here, but I, I, I don't know how to like jump from the data to a business problem or solve something like that. Uh, that's, that's one of the things we're trying to teach people in the courses I mentioned before with Matt. It's like I was a victim too of that thinking because when I was starting to learn data science and machine learning and deep learning, uh, you get all this theory and articles and you program all day long. And then when you go to your first job, you're completely lost. You have no idea how to behave in a meeting. You have no idea what uh, what questions to ask. You don't know what are, like, if you have a deadline, how to accomplish that goal. Um, there are a lot of things that they're not teaching us. And I mean, I'm a scientist. And for some reason, I think 50% of scientists right now are doing data science. So they never teach us how to uh, be business guys. We're scientists. So uh, one of the, the things we're trying to do, and I'm trying to do with my articles and my teaching, is trying to close the gap between mm. the, the data you have and the business problems you want to solve. Fabio, what would be your recommendation for those who are you know, just getting out of school or just beginning to work in the data science field? And like you, you know, uh, early on, you know, they're getting into a meeting and like like you said, they don't know what kind of questions to ask. They're, they're brand new. They're coming from the science world, the academic world. Um, what would be some tips you'd provide that person with? So, um, by the way, if, if you're interested, we have a, a, a data science live video uh, that was a conversation with Gabriela de Queiroz. She works for, for IBM and the topic was the best questions to ask. So oh. I'm, I'm gonna just extract something from there. Sure. And, and uh, one of the most important things is that you need to understand that the people in one, I mean, if you're in, in, in a meeting, there will be different types of knowledges. Like it, it will be like business guys and, and, and uh, engineers and like, I don't know, marketing people they don't know what you know and you don't know what they know. So you have to build uh, first a good conversation and, uh, and, um, um, and a platform for discussing ideas, not to, um, to, to propose and kill other ideas. Uh, it's, it's very common when you're in a meeting and you're the guy who knows data science and machine learning that you think, oh yeah, I'm the know. Um, I'm the best one here because I know all this math and stuff like that, and all the other idea are just crap. And that's not the way. Uh, <laughs> that's that's just not the way you should be doing uh, meetings. You because they know the business. You don't know the business. I mean, uh, when you're starting in data science, you may know a lot of math and calculus and and deep learning algorithms, but they understand 
their business because they've been working there for years. So what you should be doing is listen, like really mm -hmm. listen what they have to say. Uh, and a good question is a question that will lead to a good discussion on a topic, not to a problem. And when that, with that, I, I, I mean, like, what's the goal of your area? I mean, what are your KPIs? Uh, why, what are you expecting from this model? Uh, has been, uh, has someone else uh, created a model before? And what were the the results? Do you have that report? Uh, can can you show me your data and what you understand by data in your field? What does production mean to you? Uh, the, all of these different things that are are maybe obvious for you, they're not obvious for them. So you need to um, to do, to to use the Socratic method to try to 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 um, to extract from there from from them all this knowledge that they know, but they don't know how to transmit. Maybe. I think that's solid advice. I love that. Being curious, um, asking lots of good questions to get to understand what is the business need? What are the business problems? And then from that, how can I then le leverage this data to help help provide answers to that? And and what do they expect from their model? Because sometimes, I mean, I've been in meetings when after months of working, you're showing the results and they say, this is not what I asked. Mm. <laughs> and oh, then geez, that's painful. Yeah, and that's you lost three months of your life. Of, oh. of your life. I mean, and, and this is a problem when the objectives of the data science area are not directly correct. Uh, uh, they're, they're not in the, the same as the business area. So <clears throat> you need to work for their, uh, for, for their goals, not for your goals. Sometimes that's the case. And you have to be humble in, in that and, and just uh, maybe you have a, an idea that is huge and that will change the world. But right now, your boss just wants to solve a problem. They don't want to change the world. In, in, I mean, if every project you, you're going to build is going to change the world, you, 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 you're not going to have time for to, to do that. So you have to focus, solve the problem. And when you solve the problem and they're happy with that, then you can go and change the world. Mm. So Fabio, that what you just mentioned about working on a project for you know whatever, two months, three months, or even a week, if you're working hard on a project, um, based on a business problem that you think you should be solving. And then you find out that's not what they were looking for. Obviously there was some sort of miscommunication that happened because you as a data scientist is working hard to solve a problem that you think exists based on a conversation with the business leaders. What would, I mean, what did you, know, you just shared advice for the data scientists to be asking all these very good questions. How about advice for the business leaders, the people in the room that are giving direction or giving Giving direction to the data scientists, what would be your advice to the business leaders to give you know solid direction? So I think for business leaders, one of the most important things is that they should be aware of what's going on in the data science world. And they should know, I mean, they don't have to be an expert, but they have to know what's machine learning and what are the limits of machine learning. Sometimes they don't know the limits. And if you don't know the limits, you will ask for the world when you can mm -hmm. only get uh, a small piece of that. So if you're aware of the limits of the fields you're working, then it's much easier to have a realistic goal in mind. Um, and that's why, I mean, I, I believe there are a lot of like CTOs meeting and CDOs meeting, like chief data officers getting together, talking about data. I mean, they're not, they're, they're still business guys, but there's no harm on reading an article or understanding an algorithm. I mean, if, if, if you go to that place, it will be so much easier to speak to your data scientists. And, and it will be a faster communication, a more, a more effective communication, and you will be setting goals for each one of the areas you have uh, uh, that are more realistic and that can be accomplished in a period of time. Because one of the other things that are important in data science is that Projects should end, and I mean, <laughs> you don't. I mean, you when you're when you're in science, you're thinking that I have infinite time to solve this problem, and it's true because the infinite time is when you die. I mean, that's it. That that that's mm. your infinite time, but that's not the case in business because if you say to your boss, "I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need four years to solve this problem," you may get fired. So. Um, 
you, you you need to understand that in the like the rules change when you're working for someone and when you're solving a problem you need to be fast because there are more people trying to, to solve the same problem and the first one who does it is going to win the, the race so um and that's why i really talk about i uh, like to talk about like agile development in 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 data science like being an agile developer and and i i i have an article that is uh, that is a continuation of one of Matt Danch's article on a, an agile framework for doing data science, mm. and the the goal of this framework is to don't um, to to don't make the same mistakes uh, like a, a, a lot of people uh, are encountering in their lives when they don't know how to ask questions. Or they don't know the goal of the business because it's an agile framework that is strictly related to the KPIs of the field, to the uh, to the area, sorry, and it's strictly related to the business components you have in one company. So it's it, it's called the agile business science problem framework. So mm -hmm. it's strictly related to business problems with data science in an in an agile way. You, you can search for that online too. Okay, awesome. And what I'll do is um, I'll find that article and I'll put it in the comments section of this Facebook Live video as well as in the uh, comments of our YouTube video when we post it there. Um, we got a question uh, from somebody watching from Sarah. She was asking, Fabio, um, do you have any tips on dealing with the intimidation of imposter syndrome for newly graduated data scientists who just started working in the field? So that's going to happen. <laughs> you have to be aware <laughs> that uh, it's, it is a scary to start in any new field, but it's a good scary field. And it's, it's, it's not that you shouldn't be like, uh, oh my God, they're gonna uh, know that I, I'm not an expert in any of this. The, uh, they're expecting for me to be like the Andrew Angie of, uh, of this, but <laughs> I really don't know how to do these things. Um, I think uh, the the a good way to to deal with this imposter syndrome or or just dealing with entering in a, in a new field is to be honest. You need to be honest and be able to say I don't know. I mean, it's much better to say you don't know something than to make up some weird algorithm or idea to justify your your ignorance. <laughs> And mm. and love that, yeah. Yep. Because there's a lot of people that will deny forever that they don't know something to to never come as the guy who don't know that. But it's much better to say, man, I don't know this. I mean, I think I have an idea. I read some article on this, so let me go. Uh, uh, I I'll read about it. I'll I'll create an example and then I'll get back to you. I mean, that's much better than just making up something up so um, make sure you're studying regularly make sure you're you're coding you're seeing what are, are doing uh, uh, you're you're doing projects on your own time and you're just you have to be honest with with your boss and, and yourself too I mean when you're lying to someone saying that you're an expert in the field and when you're not you're lying to yourself too because the in the end the problem is gonna be with you not not with them Amen. I, I think that that honesty and humility is not only key for someone just starting out, but I think all throughout your career. Um, you know, Fabio, you were talking about how um, the senior leader should be also keeping up with at least the basics of what data science, what's happening in data science world, so they can better com effectively communicate with the data scientists on their team. And this is where humility and asking questions, being curious, like whether you're just starting out or whether you're 20 years into the field, like, hey, you know what, I don't know anything about this field. I just read an article on, you know, this particular topic, but tell me, Fabio, like, is this kind of what it's saying or am I off here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's the way. That's the only way of really being aware of something and, and, and understand a new field is to uh, just, you have to read the whole thing because sometimes people are stuck in high, level articles that are just the idea or people are stuck in like hardcore papers and none of the two uh, sites are it, 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 it it's good 
you have to be in the in, in both sides. You have to be able to read hardcore papers and simple uh, blogs. And so when because when you're trying to explain something to your boss, you're not going to explain him in the paper uh, uh, as an area. You have to be able to explain them a blog, like you're explaining to your family what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, so. Uh, it's important when you start reading and reading these different types of black like, books and articles and blogs and stuff like that. Then you get you really understand when when you really understand the topic, you're able to talk about it like you're talking about the weather, and and that's something you really need. Uh, if if you really want to be a successful data scientist, you need to be able to explain hard concepts in an easy way, and that's what science has been doing forever. I mean. Imagine mm. that in science we only write papers. That's it. I mean, there will be no advances in, in any field. I mean, like uh, a short amount of people are understanding a paper because they're spending all their lives trying to understand a field. And when you write a very hardcore paper, only a few people will get it. And we need people uh, from from the creator of that article or other articles to say, okay, this is important. I'm gonna try to write a something or explain this concept in a in an easier way for people to see the value uh, it, it has on, on on life or a field or a theory and i think fabio i think what you are doing right now with the way that you teach the way that you talk about data science even right now um, the articles that i've read that you've written and i like i said i'm not in the data science world but the way that you're able to articulate it to make something very very complex easier to understand even bringing in like you said, the theory of relativity from Einstein to bring these very complex subjects that would make my mind explode and being able to break it down is a skill that shows you've worked very, very hard to teach yourself and then thinking, how do I then relay this to everybody else? No, and, and thanks for that, Mike. But the, the thing to keep in mind is I'm not trying I mean, with, with that article Specifically, I'm not trying to make things more complex. I'm thinking in a different position here. Is that okay? I just added a new complication to data science, but maybe that complication will help people understand what is machine learning. I mean, sometimes you need to get a little more complex to then lower down uh, the uh, the the level or or the, the way people think about a, a subject. And I gave my definition of machine learning before, before the data fabric, and then after I presented machine learn, uh, the, the data fabric, I explained what's machine learning inside of the data fabric. And, and you, you can compare both of them, and I think the, new one, the, the newer one is easier to understand. And that was, for me, a, a great accomplishment because I said, okay, uh, there was a point when I was reading the article, it's like, okay, I'm building something very complex that I don't know if I'm going to be aware uh, or, or able uh, to, to explain what I'm thinking in simple words. But then after a lot of, of, of trial and error and reading the concept to people I knew, uh, and when they understood it, and when they understood the article, I said, okay, yeah, I added some complexity, but in the end, it worked because now it's easier to understand what's machine learning. It's finding an insight. It's finding, it's, it's, it's finding that piece of, of, of hidden information in your data you already have. Um, and, and if you think about it in that way uh, and you have a graph on all of these different things I, I wrote in that article, I think if people just uh, get, uh, they, if they give it a chance, uh, maybe it, it's going to be easier for them to understand what's machine learning. In the next article I'm writing, that's a part one, uh, I'm going to be trying to explain in an even deeper way what I mean uh, by, by machine learning in a graph and, and how that can help us do better, uh, be better in data science. Wonderful. For those listening to the podcast, I'll have a URL uh, for that article. You can go to ex.pn slash data talk Fabio, and you can find I'll have that redirect directly to that article on machine learning where uh, Fabio uh, proposes a new definition 
as well as explaining uh, these different concepts. Again, the, the URL is just going to be ex.pn slash datatalk Favio, F-A-V-I-O. So that'll just redirect over because I think everyone needs to check out that article that you just wrote. And I love, Fabio, that you um, don't just stick with uh, current definitions, but as things are evolving and changing, that you're willing to propose new definitions. I think that takes a lot of guts. Yeah, and I did that last year with data science. I gave my definition of data science. And I'm doing that not to say that my definition is the best one, just trying to... Um, to make this field a serious field of study. Because, I mean, I've, I've done this before, but I'll do it again. Um, if you compare physics in the, nine, in the 1900s, when, the, when this, in the start of modern physics, like quantum mechanics and relativity, all of these different things, people were just, just lost. It's like, what's, this, what's going on? We were happy with Newton. I mean, just please take me back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then because they, they really thought that everything was invented. Like, okay, yeah, well, this is it. We understand the world. Is Newton theory of mechanics. Is uh, Maxwell theory of electromagnetics. It's Faraday's law, whatever. But then this guy like Einstein and Schrodinger and Heisenberg and Planck all they came together and realized that there was something missing. And, and, and they tried to explain that in, a, in, in very different ways. And they didn't know they were creating a new field for science. It's modern physics. And, and I, I think this is happening with data science right now. There's a lot of different things and people are trying to build different things. And we, we really don't know what we're doing. I mean, we're solving problems and we're doing like clustering algorithms and linear regression and logistic regression and building deep learning algorithms and neural nets. But where's the bigger picture? Where is the, the, the bigger picture? This is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, to, um, to understand everything people are doing, and that's very hard, to, to, to be able to create a bigger picture for data science. Like, what's, what's data science? Is it a new field? Is this statistics with, with steroids? I mean, is it just uh, data mining? Uh, is, or is it a new thing we're, we're, we're mm -hmm. creating and we don't know about it? So this is what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm trying to put myself in a higher level, try to see things from, mm -hmm. from the top and, and understanding the patterns people are trying to do in deep learning, and data science, and machine learning, and all, and all of these different things, and trying to give a simple definition. And that's hard, but necessary. Because if you, th if you ask someone right now, what is physics, they will give you some definition. Maybe it's not the best definition, but they have a definition. But if you ask people what's data science right now, they don't have a definition. And, and that's important because if it's, the sexiest job of this 21st century, or of of is is right now the highest paying the the highest paying job right now we have in the world, and we don't know what it is. Is that's weird. So this is what I'm trying to do. I'm 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 trying to keep descriptions and definitions of the field so people can tell their families what they're doing, so people can tell their mom, hey mom, I'm the scientist and, and this is what I do. Because sometimes you don't know how to, I mean, you don't, you don't know how to say that. So that's that's one of the ideas for that. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I've asked some different data scientists in this show, like how do they explain their job, you know, at a family gathering? And it, it is very complicated because all the work that you're doing with mathematics and programming and working with data sets, cleaning data sets, all the maths involved, very complicated. Yeah, I mean, um, it's complicated, but we need to have a way to explain what we're doing to ourselves to, and to others. Sometimes it's going to be hard to, to, I mean, you don't have to explain everything you do. I mean, it's not true that if you're writing an, a paper, everyone should un understand the paper. That's not true. Because, I mean, if you said that everyone will understand uh, the, the new advances in theoretical physics, in the Gaussian fields, no one will understand that, but it's important for them. So for, for us, it's important to be able to, when you're talking to colleagues, 
uh, speak the same language, but when you talk to talk to some to someone else from outside of the field, you're speaking a language that they understand and you understand too. And I, I think that, that that has been one of the issues. So that's why people really don't understand data science. And has been some important people in the world saying data science is just a new term for statistics or machine learning is just the same or for 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 every uh, I mean this is just the same things over and over again and in part that's true but we're really creating a new field where we're trying to explain data in a new way because before I mean someone told me once like everything in science is data science because we all use data mm -hmm. and that's something that can be thinking, okay, that, that may be true, but this is something different here because data is the main topic here. It's not something we're using to solve something. Mm -hmm. It's that sometimes you're understanding data just for understanding data, not for solving a bigger problem. So that's one of the, the biggest difference. When you're doing science, you're collecting data for solving a uh, nature problem. Here, we're trying to solve something, but sometimes you're only solving a problem for the sake of understanding the data. So um, I think this is really a new field and the name of data science is something we have right now. I I don't think it's gonna be the same name forever. I mentioned that before. I, I think it's gonna be evolving, but what we're creating a, um, an organizer of fields like data science is now joining math and computer science and machine learning and deep learning and business uh, and and like people with MBAs, they're happy to do data science now. So it's a good field to be in right now. You can be a physicist or a biologist or, or a mathematician or a, or a lawyer and do data science and that's just fun. Uh, be before we go, Fabio, what, what excites you about the future of data science? I think I'm excited to see what's going to happen in the um, semantic world. I I dream of a day where I can say to my computer, hey, computer, please give me the average time people are spending on my website just without writing any code. <laughs> so um, I don't think we're that far away from that because there are ways to connect in like Alexa and Google Home, stuff like that, to databases right now. And you can ask, uh, and I, I don't know if you're aware, but in Google Sheets, uh, you can write stuff like in, in natural language and they'll create queries in like in Excel for you and give you the answer. So we're not that far away from being oh. able to speak to, to, to data that way. And I think when we're, the, the jump to graph databases and semantics and ontologies and all of these different things I'm trying to build right now, um, are going to help the way we do data science and are going to make them, uh, are, are, they're going to make it easier. And the connection uh, with auto machine learning and auto deep learning and all of these different things are just making the, the job easier and easier. And that's, that's just awesome because we can focus on solving problems, not on building machine learning algorithms. Because if you're spending so much time trying to build a graph, or trying to build a plot to understand a pattern, you're just missing time. If there's a, a tool that can help you do that while you're focusing on writing a report, um, on understanding the, the financial uh, um, uh, the, the financial impact of, on, on what you're doing on, and how to, to tell the story with your solving, that's, when, that's the value of, of data science, not building machine learning algorithms. That's just the way we, we get from that. Mm. And I think, I think that to that point, Fabio, it's about by staying active and learning and growing, by finding out where certain libraries are located, where certain tools do for you, that'll help you accelerate your, your work. Yeah, I mean, last year I had a project called Weekly Digest for Data Science where I um, just, I mean, I did that before for, for myself, where I have a, like a little note uh, saying that this week the best uh, library was this on GitHub. And then I realized this, this can help other people too. And I have a newsletter. Uh, I'm gonna give that a continuation this month 
where I highlight the best uh, libraries and packages and and blogs and stuff for data That's science. Awesome. Yeah, because the thing is, there's so much things going on, and there are bad things going on too. So you <clears> really <throat> need to be aware to discern what's good and what's bad. And that's not easy, so uh, that's, what, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give people a good direction on what they should be seeing, trying, and testing on data science. Uh, and they're in Python and R. I mean, I'm building for those, for those two languages. I think I'm going to add one more language this, uh, this year. I'm not sure uh, what's that language, but I'm going to do it. Oh, that is so cool. Fabio, for those that want to keep up um, with the work that you're doing, um, especially all the educational um, content you're developing to help others, or even your email list, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? So the best way to contact me is through LinkedIn. Um, please write a note. Right now, sadly, I'm not able to accept that many people anymore because I'm reaching the, the 30,000 limit on LinkedIn. And I have a lot of people waiting for my uh, for um, for me to connect with them. I, I if I don't know you, I, I'm sadly cannot connect with you. But if you leave a message there saying what's the purpose of your connection, I'm happy to talk with you. Or you can write me an email. I, my email is on my GitHub and on my LinkedIn. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter too. My my my, my username is Fabio Vaz. And if I'm writing there some stuff too, and po and posting uh, about my articles and things I'm finding on, on online. Awesome. And for those uh, listening to the podcast, uh, you can do exactly what Fabio says. Just type in Fabio Vasquez on LinkedIn um, or on Twitter. Um, I have a short URL, which is just ex.pn slash datatalk70. That's ex.pn slash datatalk70. That'll bring you over to um, the Experian blog post that will feature Fabio, as well as links to his different social media profiles. So that's just a quick URL, um, so you can follow him on Twitter and LinkedIn, because he's, he's definitely the man to follow uh, to keep up with uh, what's happening in the data science world, and also just keep up with all the things that Fabio is doing. He's doing so many cool things, teaching others through Business uh, Science University. Uh, he's doing his own interviews um, with different data science leaders and writing a ton. He's just doing a lot to help our data science community. So it's just so cool. You definitely want to follow him on LinkedIn. By the way, Fabio, can you talk briefly about your interview series? Oh, yeah. So um, if you remember last year, or I don't know when, when that started, uh, we had something called Data Science Office Hours. And there was- That's right. Um, and right now, I think all of us are the top 10 LinkedIn voices for data science. Uh, but for some reason, some of those guys, I mean, we're still talking, but they don't have the time to be on YouTube or talk about something. So Kristen Ketter and I got together and say, hey, I have time and I'm interested in doing this. So we created something called Data Science Life. Uh, you can find that as datasciencelife.com. And for you to see our past webinars and what we're doing there in the beginning was just talking about data science as a field, like what's data science, stuff like that. And then we realized that we had good connections, both Kristen and I. And, and now what we're trying to do is to talk with them and, and, and just uh, share with them our experiences, what they have to say, ask them questions. You can go there too and ask live questions. Tomorrow, we'll be interviewing Kirk Bourne. And Kirk Bourne is a very famous guy in the, in the data science world. He's a, 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 a number one influencer in the data science world. And, he, and, and so we had before Matt Dancho, we had before Gabriela, and we'll more getting more and more people in, in the future uh, for them to talk about what they're doing, uh, or just to, meant to talk about a specific topic that will help people to do better in data science. So cool. Well, Fabio, um, thank you again for your time this morning to share with our community about the work you're doing, to share your thoughts on the future of where data science is headed. Um, and also, uh, thank you again for all the work that you're doing to support and encourage and help uh, the data science community. 
uh, to continue to grow and evolve. So thank you so much and hope that we can have you on the show again. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Yeah, I'll be, uh, I'll be honored to have to, to, to just be here again. And thanks everyone for listening. Uh, make sure to just keep studying, keep trying, and never give up. Awesome. Thanks, Fabio. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.